Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and in today's episode, we'll find out what it takes to photograph the most famous and most powerful man in the world. So buckle up, grab a cold one, and let's shake it up right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 158. But hold on, if you enjoy this podcast, please join the Camera Shake community over on camerashakepodcast.com so that you're the first ones to know when we've got some exciting news for you. You'll find the link in the description, or if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be right down here somewhere on the screen. But without further ado, let's welcome today's special guest, the best-selling author, photojournalist, and probably the only person who has shot not one, but two presidents of the United States, the official White House photographer for Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama. Give it up for Mr. Pete Sousa. Pete, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm super thrilled to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Pete, what was it like when you first heard that you got the job photographing Barack Obama? Uh, I mean, it wasn't a, a complete surprise. I, I kind of had a heads up that I was being considered for the job. It's not a job that you necessarily apply for. Um, I was on his radar um, because I had gotten to know him when I was working for the Chicago Tribune, you know, his hometown newspaper, and I had, spent a, I had actually spent a lot of time with him when he was a U.S. senator. Uh, so I had established a professional relationship with him, and he, you know, he had a chance to see how I worked uh, and, and the pictures that I made. And so when it came time, when he was elected president, I knew that I'd be in the running for the job. Obviously, I was excited. Um, I, had, I had been an official photographer, as you mentioned, for, for Reagan, but not the chief photographer. And, um, you know, by, by the time President Obama was elected, I felt that I was a much more seasoned photojournalist and was really, even though I don't consider myself the best photographer in the world, I thought I was the right choice to, to be his official photographer. You mentioned uh, you, you already, you'd done a stint uh, with Ronald Reagan um, back in the 80s, and you mentioned you weren't the, the chief photographer. So I'm, I'm guessing it's a team effort. It's a team effort. Uh, usually uh, 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 here in the U.S., a, a president since the LBJ administration, so since the uh, uh, mid to late 60s, I guess mid 60s, uh, the a U.S. president usually chooses, uh, hires a, a chief photographer, and then there's uh, that person then has a staff under them. Um, and so for Reagan, I was not the chief. Michael Evans was the chief photographer, and he hired me to to work, uh, you know, on on his staff basically. I once I heard in in the uh... In, in another interview with yourself, I heard that you shot about 2,000 images whilst you were um, photographing Barack Obama. Two million, actually. Two million, yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, Two million, which, you know, it sounds like a lot, but if you divide that by, you know, 365 days a year, eight years, it's not, it's not like an enormous amount of photographs. It's a lot, but it's not uh, as, as much as you would think. Well, it still sounds like, you know, it sounds like shooting an event every day, basically, to me. <laughs> well, it's more, you know, I mean, one of the things that I uh, strive to do was to create an archive of behind the scenes images, not necessarily just the events, but what was going on, uh, you know, when the doors were closed and I was the only one in the room trying to really... Um, document in a, in a very historic kind of way what he was like as president, but also as just as a human being. And he understood the need to have somebody create this visual archive of, of his presidency. Um, as you can imagine, for anybody to have a photographer tagging along with you, shadow, 
essentially shadowing you all day long takes a you know a little bit getting used to um but you know i just, i sort of had a knack of being able to do that and not being a nuisance and being able to do it in a, in a very unobtrusive way um and you know and he sort of got it i mean he 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 just understood the need to have this this visual archive of of a presidency uh, uh so um you know, I give a lot of credit to him for trusting me to give me the the kind of access that you really need to to do such a good job um, in in documenting a, a a president. It was really also it was at the time of uh, let's call it the emergence of social media and yes, you know, two thousand nine. Right. I think I th I think if I remember correctly, I think I first joined Facebook in two thousand eight. So it was just about that time. I suppose. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, his campaign uh, utilized social media, Facebook and Twitter uh, in a way that no other, you know, campaign had done. Um, and, you know, Instagram actually did, did not even come along until 2010. Um, I, I eventually started a, a, at, at the behest of the White House Communications Office, I started a official Instagram account uh while i was at the white house but not until 2012 um and so um you know it, it sort of took a, a a little getting used to in terms of i always thought of this job is is strictly documenting the presidency for history which is you know the primary function of this job all all of these photographs um we have what's called the national archives where every single photograph that I ever shot during both the Reagan and Obama administrations are now at the National Archives. Like you can't delete photos or anything like that. So I always looked at this job as a, you know, knowing that's, that most of my pictures would not be seen right away, but, you know, many years hence. With Obama, it, it turned out that a lot of them were used I wouldn't say necessarily in real time, but in, you know, in present time. In, in other words, we started a Flickr photo stream, which in 2009 was sort of a, I think probably one of the main ways of sharing photos online because, it, it, again, Instagram wasn't yet invented. <laughs> um, and so we started this Flickr photo stream, and what we would do is every every month go through the behind the scenes photos and curate a collection of images to post on Flickr. So, you know, that was brand new in terms of what, um, pre you know, presidential administrations would do regarding photos where you'd really get to see a month later, the behind the scenes photos from the, from the month before. And I'm guessing that's, is very different, obviously, for, you know, compared to, the Reagan administration, where I guess you shot everything on film. Did you actually, did you get to see the developed shots or did you just hand over the rolls of film and that was that? Was that? Yeah, so the logistics <laughs> of Reagan was we, Michael Evans, the chief photographer, um, I, I didn't start until the middle of the first term. So I came in in June of 83. And of course, Reagan took office in January of 81. So Michael had made the decision to shoot all color negative film, um, which was, he was the first administration to do that. Um, and so everything we shot was on negative film. Now, later, during the second term of Reagan, I started shooting some black and white as well. Um, and we all of our film would, would go to... A, a uh, military photo lab that had security clearance and all that kind of stuff. And they would process the film uh, and, and, and um, hold the negatives there because they were in a secure facility and send us back the proof sheets, you know, like uh, contact sheets um, for, for the, those of your listeners that are, remember the analog days of, uh, of, uh, contact sheets. Uh, and from there, if we were going to um, edit, choose any images, um, we would just then call the lab up and say, hey, can we get a 
print of this or a print of that, that sort of thing. So how, how was that? Um, pro, how, did, how did that process work during the Obama years? I'm guessing it was all digital by then. Yeah, everything was all digital um, and everything was handled. The, you know, the processing, well, the downloading, the captioning, the keywording uh, was all handled in-house. We had a photo archivist in my office. Um, you know, every single file, every single photo had an AP style caption attached to it. The photo archivist would then go through and try to identify as many people as possible in the photo. So there was a record of that. And then also, uh, she designed a series of keywords, uh, which, you know, so I think our, the archive that we created is in, is going to be enormously invaluable for researchers and much easier to search for what you're looking for compared to previous administrations because we such i think we did such a great and diligent job of making sure that each file had all the proper information attached to it and then when we at the end of the administration when we made the transfer of our archive to the national archives all that information got passed on you know so i just think i i, I feel proud not just of the images but the way we uh, stored the information with each each photograph. That's, that sounds like a huge, enormous effort. It's an enormous effort, but you know the the, the key, as I'm learning now, because uh, you know I I sort of archive my own personal stuff now. I'm trying to be diligent about uh, doing my captions and keywords right away. You know, just as I'm, I just downloaded some photos this morning this morning from the weekend and made sure that I had, you know, captions, keywords, dates, places, um, already attached so that it's, you know, so, cause like, if you just let it go for a week or two or three, then you're, you know, you're playing catch up all the time. I feel like I've let so it I go for I, years. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, I think we did a really good job. I mean, it helped obviously that I had a team and then I had a photo archivist. Um, but you know, it was important to, to keep at it every day. Um, uh, so that, you know, at the end of the, cause like if you didn't at the end of the administration, you'd just be like crashing, trying to re remember this or remember that or, um, so anyway. That's actually, I mean, that's an interesting thing because obviously you've, you've authored um, a number of, of books, um, that go back to the time of the Obama, um, administration. And I always wondered, how, first of all, how you create your images in your books, but also how you, or whether you have sort of immediate access to those shots or yeah. you know, what the process is there. Yeah, so the, um, anything that was made public during the administration, whether we posted it on Flickr or the White House website or, you know, uh, the press office said he's doing an interview with NBC. We want to send them 10 photos that have not yet, you know, been made public, you know, sort of new photos. Um, so I would have immediate access to any of those photos uh, because they, if they were made public, then they were considered in the public domain. There's no, there's no copyright with official White House photos. Um, and then for my books, there were a few photos that, uh, had not yet been made public that I wanted to include, and um, and I would I would have to get a sign off from uh, President Obama for those, and and a few because of the sensitivity. Um, I, I also took the extra step of contacting the people in the photos that that were not him uh, to um, make sure that they were okay with it. Um, so that's the way it works. So, how did you approach the, the the task of documenting both the the official and the behind the scenes aspects of the administration at the time? Yeah, I mean, I think I I mean I consider it all official, I guess, uh, in the sense of uh, you know anything that he's doing nine to five. I mean, it's longer than nine to five, but 
during the working day that relates to the presidency, whether it's an event or you know a meeting, private meeting, to me, that's still official. So that's the way I looked at it anyway. And then, um, you know, I think I think it was. I guess it was fortunate. I I was fortunate in that he had he had a very young family. You know, his uh, his two girls were uh, 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 seven. Let me see. I think seven and ten when he was uh, 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 inaugurated. So, you know, I documented. A, a, many aspects of their family life and that would be a little more um uh considering what the family would like in other words anything during the day anything that had to do with the presidency um i n- i didn't have to ask permission to photograph i mean i photographed everything when it came to the family um, if it was not at an official event, like it was private family time, then I would work that out with him directly on whether he wanted me to photograph, if he wanted me to be there, that sort of thing. Um, and there's a little, there's also uh, a little bit more protection. I don't know if protection is the right word. Um, it, you know, eventually all the official photographs, including all the meetings and things like that, all of that will be made public eventually, all of those photographs. With the private family events, um, he can decide to keep those private, even though they're in the National Archives. Um, If it's not from an official event with the family, then those are more, uh, can be more private, uh, if you will. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess it, it takes a, a great deal of, of uh, tactfulness to know when to photograph and, and when maybe not to, especially in those private moments. Yeah, but, it, you know, in, 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 um, if I was there, then, there, there, <laughs> uh, then it wasn't. I mean, there are many times that, he, that either he or, or Rochelle or uh, somebody from their staff would let me know, hey, they're doing this family event, you know, Friday night or Saturday night. Can you can you show up? <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't have known about it otherwise, you know, because like I, I wasn't necessarily privy to all their family activities. Uh now obviously if he was leaving the White House, I would always go with him, no matter what. Uh but if you know they could be doing a family activity at home, and I might not know about it. One thing I was wondering about is, um, it, in your opinion, what role does the visual storytelling aspect play in shaping the public perception of the president himself or the administration as a whole? Yeah, I, I you know I don't know that he, I'm even the right person to. Uh, answer that question in that I was so, I was so close to what was happening. Um, my, it, it, I, you know, I mentioned that we curated uh, um, photos on Flickr every month. You know, mostly behind the scenes photos, and I always looked at that as a as a chance to choose. Um, the best and most authentic pictures from the previous month, and n- nothing more, nothing less than that. Um, the the, and I think people got to know him in a more intimate way through my photographs, which speaks to what you're saying, I guess. Um, but it's hard for me to speak to that because I, you know, I don't. I was so insulated that I didn't even realize, you know, to a certain extent, I didn't realize how closely people were paying attention to to my photographs. Yeah, it was because I, I think you know, it was the first time that we as the public got a real behind the scenes inside look into what life in the White House was really like, you know, in comparison to previous administrations, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think I I look at, you know, my predecessors, I mean, Yoshio Komodo, who was uh, 
LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson's photographer, David Kennerly, who is President Ford's photographer. Um, I, you know, I think their level of access and the kind of pictures they got were just as good, if not better than mine, but social media didn't exist then. And so you, you, you didn't, you didn't see as many photos coming out of those two administrations until much later on. Um, and I think, you know, it just so happened that as you, you said at, at the very top that, that, uh, President Obama took office right in the midst of this, I can't remember the word you word, but it was kind of the, the, the explosion of social media in, in, in many ways. And I think the Obama administration, as would have any administration, had they been in that uh, time period, would have taken advantage of, you know, the social media. Do you think we will get to see um, an as intimate insight into the behind the scenes, into goings on? in the administration that follow Barack Obama? No, because those pictures don't exist. Uh, the photographer did not have the kind of access that I did, um, which is a shame. Um, I mean, there's been a couple pictures that have come out that are behind the scenes, but for the most part, um, it, uh, you know, there's, there's not a, a really good record of like for example, January sixth, there's there's no photographs behind the scenes on that day, which, um, you know, is is unfortunate. I think. Yeah, I think unfortunate, unfortunately, is a is a very mild word. Yeah, to use for that. Um, so you were talking about access, and I know um, I've heard you say before that one of the reasons why you decided to take the job was because you were granted virtually unlimited access at the time. Were there moments where your access was denied and, and did you have to overcome that? Maybe like by some White House staffer? I mean, the so there was like early on, uh, I was in some meeting in the Situation Room and some NASA, national security aide said to me, you don't have the right clearance to be in the room. And I, and I, and I, you know, so I left and I went to see the national security chief of staff. And I said, I need a different clearance. I need to get, you know, a clearance so I can always be in the room. Uh, and I got that, <laughs> you know, I had to go through a process where you get interviewed and all that kind of stuff. And they look into your background, but I made sure that after that day, that I had the proper security clearance, and I can go in any meeting. Some of your photographs are so um, significant because they were taken at such significant moments in history. I'm thinking the um, what was it called the, the 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 Situation Room during the Bin Laden raid, for example. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? being in that room at that time. Yeah, I mean, so that was uh, uh, certainly a historic day. And I think that the, um, it, it was, I think the two words to describe uh, that, that day and that uh, being in that room were uh, tension and uh, anxiety. Uh, I mean, we're talking about this what, 12 years after the fact. Um, I think what people lose sight of is that uh, the, 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 that raid being successful was not a given. They did, they did not know for 100% sure that bin Laden was even there. You know, um, It was a risky decision to launch that aid. I mean, to launch that raid. No question. Um, and, um, a lot of things can go wrong. Something did go wrong where a helicopter ended up almost essentially crash landing. And yet they, they had prepared for every scenario that even though that helicopter bit the dust, nobody died, you know, no 
member of that team was injured. Um, but, you know, it was a risky, risky uh, raid. And so I think that um, you, could, you could feel that uh, as all, as he and his aides watched, you know, this whole raid unfold, just not knowing what was going to happen. And I also, when I give my uh, public presentations and I show that photo, I also mention that, you know, all, all the people in that room are used to being decision makers. Um, uh, and they had, you know, he had made his decision. But now, you know, they, they were, there was nothing they could do in the moment to affect the outcome. And so that's got to be a very unsettling feeling to be sitting there watching this ray take place and not knowing whether it was going to be su successful or not. So that gives you a little bit of background of what the feeling was like, I think. So at that moment when you were in that room and everything was happening, I'm, I'm guessing there were probably watching screens of what was going on at the time yeah. was it was it difficult to concentrate on your job at that time i mean how did you keep it together at that, at that point when all of that's going on behind you and and that atmosphere is is happening in that room um it, i think to keep in mind this this was may 2011 so i had already been in the job for two and a half years had been in the situation room like so many times for so many meetings and obviously, the, the what was taking place was much different than you know previous meetings in that room. Um, but there was a fam familiarity in being in very tight, tense situations. Um, logistically, uh, because they had moved into this small conference room, um, the challenge for me was I couldn't really move around. Like usually, I was able to move around different parts of the room, but people were just kind of jammed in there. You know, and that was, the, was the first thing I thought when I saw that picture. I remember seeing that picture back in the day and I'm thinking like, where is the photographer? Like how, how do you fit in this room? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I literally had, uh, my, my rear end was, uh, uh, touching a, a laser printer in the corner of the room. I couldn't go back any further. I had somebody touching my shoulder, standing, and they were t I was touching shoulders with them to my right. There was a guy sitting right in front of me. Like, I, I could touch his chair. Uh, and, like, I had nowhere to go, so I was kind of stuck in this, this spot, um, which in some ways made it easier to, to just blend into the scene, you know, that I wasn't moving around a lot. Obviously, I would have liked to have had different angles, but it just was not possible. So, and I was very selective and and uh, photographing, um, so that I, you know, this is this is before mirrorless cameras were really uh, any good, and so I was using a DSLR on you know a quiet mode, but still, I was trying to be extra quiet because the you no, most of the time nobody was talking. And I didn't want to like interrupt, you know, the flow of, of the, you know, just the mood of what was taking place. So I was very selective on when I actually um, clicked the shutter. And um, the, the, the raid itself lasted for like, I think, 40 minutes. So we were in that little conference room for 40 minutes. And I think I only shot like 100 pictures, which is not a lot you know, in 40 minutes. Um, so I was being very selective on when I was uh, clicking the shutter, um, just, to, just to be as unobtrusive as possible. So when, I think, you know, once you've shared moments like this with the president, um, you must have developed a really close relationship with Barack Obama at the time. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, one of the things that's interesting is, as you can imagine, somebody that's a former president of the United States has a ton of friends and, you know, acquaintances and, um, and things like that. I mean, the, 
but I was the only one in that administration that shared uh, in, in, in a way that nobody else did the, um, all the emotions that he went through as president. Um, sure, any, anything involving national security, his national security aid would, would have been there. Um, but I, but I was also there for all his, you know, his family moments, uh, and for his, you know, domestic moments and his vacation moments. And, um, so I think there's a, there's a unspoken bond between the two of us that just doesn't exist between other people. I mean, I, I think I would consider him a friend. I think he considers me a friend. Um, but it's, but it's based on a professional relationship more than it is, you know, strictly, you know, personal friends, if you will. I think in a situation where you're, you know, you're the leader of, of a country to, to have somebody around you who, you know, takes pictures without judgment yeah, must be quite refreshing since in politics, I guess, even the next guy next to you is in, to some degree judgmental. Yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, it's not to say that, uh, no, I think that's absolutely right. And, um, and I, and I didn't, um, it, you know, it's, it's funny cause, uh, um, I, I, I worked for two presidents from completely polar opposite, you know, views of, of, you know, policy and politics. And, um, I think part of that is due to the fact that both both of them, wh whatever you think of Barack Obama or Ronald Reagan politically, um, I thought they were both decent human beings. And I think it would be really hard for me to do that job working for somebody that I didn't respect as a as a human being. Like I could never have worked for Donald Trump. You know, I I just couldn't have done it. Uh, And it had nothing to do with politics. It would have. It was just like, you know, I just don't respect him. What can I say? Was that was that clear to you right from the beginning, or was that something that sort of became clear to you as the administration went on? Well, I think with Reagan, it didn't it didn't become evident until the administration went on because I didn't know him at all coming in. Whereas with Barack Obama, I had gotten to know him a little bit. Um you know, had seen the way he interacted with his family. Um, and so, you know, I kind of knew that he, he was a, a, a decent person. So do you think there are any very specific images that um, have had sort of a lasting impact on the public's perception of the president? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's it again. It's hard for me to make that judgment. I mean, the, the, I think the two, the two photographs that um, uh, you know, as people were looking back at his administration as uh, his time came to a close, the two of the photographs that were often uh, used. Um, were the you know the bin Laden raid photo but then also the 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 one of the little boy uh touching his head a little black kid who uh had said to the president that his friends had told him that his haircut was just like president obama's and and uh you know president obama bent over and said go ahead and touch my head and i think that that interaction in, in many ways, I think spoke volumes to, uh, you know, people of color, especially kids of color that, you know, here's this young African-American kid touching the head of the president of the United States that looks like him. Uh, and I, and I think that in some communities that, that picture really resonated. And I think it told you a lot about Barack Obama too, that, you know, he would, he would bend over like that and let that kid you know, touch his head. And then I think that some of the pictures of him interacting with his girls, um, you know, there's one of his favorite pictures is, uh, we had a big snowstorm in DC 
Uh, and I, I was tagging along with him and the girls one Saturday, right in the middle of the snowstorm. Uh, and I got a picture of him doing snow angels with the girls, you know, on the South Lawn. And, you know, and I think that just, it, it's such a human moment. Be, and, and, and he, you know, it just should, like, that's something that any dad would be doing with their kids, right, in a snowstorm. Um, and so I think pictures like that really gave people some insight into what he was like just as a, you know, a dad, a, just a human being, uh, and not necessarily connected to him being president. And actually, those are the kind of photos that are my favorites, is the, the ones that are not from big historic events, but are like moments from sort of everyday life um, that I think tell you a lot about him as a person. It's, been, it's phenomenal to have that insight nowadays, you know, with not only because digital technology probably makes it easier and cheaper to produce that amount of, of footage in the first place, but also because social media has put that demand on, on, you know, on you or on, you know, um, on any White House photographer nowadays or any photographer who's, who's photographing any person of note is to create all of that content that's being used and reused um, all over the shop. And so as a, I think as a consequence, we get a lot more of an insight. Yeah, I mean, I think that also, I think that when, as, as a, you know, as a body of work, when people go through my photographs, I think they can tell they're authentic. You know, I think they can tell these are not like staged photos, that this is just life unfolding and I'm, you know, capturing these moments as they take place. Whereas if you look at most of the Trump photos, you can tell they're all from like, you know, some kind of reality show version of, uh, you know, life in the White House. <laughs> well, I mean, I think um, that's always the danger is, is that, you know, because the, the approach can, can swing too far the other way where everything seems to be, you know, polished and staged yeah. rather than authentic and true. Right. You can, and I think most people can tell the difference. I do. I think most people can tell the difference. What was um, it like? What was it like in the in the White House on the day that um, the Republicans won back in twenty seventeen? Uh, yeah. Well, that, well, it was twenty sixteen. But um, the 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 way we you know we have our election, and then it's like three months before. Take off. Anyway, um, yeah, no, it was not. It was uh, um, the day after the election. Um, it was pretty somber. <laughs> I mean, he didn't lose, right? Uh, it was that his, um, you know, Hillary, who had been a secretary of state, lost to Trump. And of course, you know, the, the feeling was that everything that he had accomplished would you know, get a lot of it might get washed away. And so people were very down. I mean, people were crying the next morning. And I, I mean, I sort of had a different view. I mean, I think maybe because I, I was older than many of the staff and had lived through, you know, the Kennedy assassination, which happened when I was like in third grade, I think and Watergate, and 9-11, and all these things that set our country back, you know, we recovered from them, right? Um, and so as, as bad as this was, I think that, you know, I felt that this was just a step back, and, you know, we're, we, we would eventually recover from this. But I think a lot of the young staff had, this was the first, really bad thing that happened in our country um you know it, it, th that happened as uh, for them as adults you know they were a lot of these 20 something year old kids were you know kind of too young to really understand what 911 was all about in many ways um so yeah it was not a, it was not a good day <laughs> as they say let me just say a quick thank you to our sponsor, DVE Store. 
DV Store's mission is to help you create better video and provide you with the tools necessary to explore your creativity. If you have any digital video equipment needs, whether that's camera equipment, audio gear or lighting, and much more, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Thank you to DV Store for the high def video. And of course, you can find a link to DV Store in the description. How did you deal with the, the pressures of, of constantly having to be present? Um, I'm guessing, did you, was it a seven day work week? For the most part, I mean, I tried to, especially in the second term, I tried to take Sundays off if I could. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it was hard. Uh, it was hard physically. It was hard, um, you know, on my personal life. Um, but I always, I always remind folks that don't feel sorry for me because, you know, I knew what I was getting myself into. I, I did have staff that could cover for me if I, if I couldn't be there. I chose to be there all the time. Um, you know, I, I felt, um, that it was important for me to be there all the time. And I didn't want to ever miss anything because, you, you know, you don't ever know when um, history is going to take place. I mean, everything that happens in the world somehow affects the President of the United States. Uh, and you don't always know when those things are going to happen. So my attitude was, you know, just be there all the time because I, I just didn't want to miss anything. Did you ever feel the weight of the moment on you in, in those particular moments? Uh... No, I don't, I don't think, I didn't feel them on me. I felt them on him sometimes. You know, I felt, uh, I think I was, I was a good uh, observer of his, uh, you know, his uh, mood and disposition. Um, so much so that, you know, oftentimes his chief of staff, who, you know, wouldn't necessarily be with him all day long, would, you know, I would, uh, he would come find me and just say, how's he doing today? <laughs> you know, because he knew I, I knew better than anybody uh, what his day had been like and what, what, where the tensions had come up and things like that. I mean, getting to know somebody this closely, um, that must have sometimes weighed quite heavily when, you know, especially when there were difficult decisions that had to be made on that day or, or things had gone catastrophically wrong or something like that. That must, that must have been, you know, there must have been quite a weight on your shoulder at the time. I don't think it was quite a weight on my, my shoulder. Uh, I mean, the, um, you know, this is a guy who had a pretty even keeled disposition. And um, it wouldn't necessarily show um, to to the lay person, uh, you know, the layman, like uh, what his what what his uh, you know particular mood was at any moment. But I could tell. I mean, I you know, I could I could feel his pain when <laughs> when things were not going, uh, you know. Right. And, um, uh, you, you know, and I think I was, a, I think I was more aware of that than, 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 than probably most people that worked around him. Were there ever any, any moments where you thought, oh, okay, I'm just not going to push the shutter button here for a minute? Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of not not when what not when it involved uh you know like uh important historical or important policy decisions uh you know I felt that no matter what I had to be there for those and I had to click the shutter for those um but there are times like you know I know the guys got you know, a sinus infection is not feeling very well. And, you know, I would try to give him space in terms of photographing, uh, you know, in, in, when, when he's having a day like that, you know what I'm saying? Just, uh, 
he's just he's, might not be fi- feeling that well physically. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be an annoyance to him in those situations. And, you know, that's all in, intuitive. Like, I, I'd have to make, I have to gut check myself all the time on making decisions like that because I always erred on the side of make the picture no matter what. And yet I'll, you know, try to keep in mind he's a human being, you know, and, you know, if I was, had a sinus infection and felt like shit, you know, I wouldn't want somebody photographing me, you know, wiping my nose or something like that. And so, you know, I just try to look at it on a human to human level, um, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. But when, it, but when it came to, you know, like I said, important decisions, uh, no matter how sensitive or emotional I felt, I, I would always, um, uh, I always felt I had to make the picture. I want to talk to you a little bit about the technical aspects um, of, yep. of working at the White House. Um, so you mentioned earlier, we, we talked at the very beginning, we talked about the sheer amount of, of photographs that you created during that time. Um, what, was the, what was the situation with, like, let's say you'd be taking photographs, would you go and sort of pre-edit them or, or would, you, uh, would you delete some of them or would you curate them or would just simply everything that you just shot Go to the archives. Yeah, so everything I shot in, in, ends up at the National Archives. Um, so each day, um, because I was with him essentially all day. And what I would do is, you know, this is when we were shooting digital. So I would take my, you know, digital cards uh, and um, drop them off, you know, maybe three times a day with someone from my office and they would download them, um, uh, get the captioning and keyword process started. We had a numbering system that we used in terms of file numbers. Um, and you know, there were some, some days I would never even look at my photos, just, I wouldn't have time. Um, if for example, there was an immediate need for one of my photos let's say the white house was doing a you know a post on the white house website on uh his meeting that day with angela merkel at the white house uh and they would want a photo to go with that whatever they were writing and so somebody on my staff would go through my photos and they'd pick out two or three choose two or three send them to me and then from that, I would say, okay, let's let's send send the White House team, you know, number two. Or I thought I had one of them as they were walking out that seemed nice. Can you can you can you take a look at that? See if that works. That sort of thing. And that's kind of how it went. Basically, it was a little more involved. I was a little more involved when it came to doing the monthly Flickr photos where. Um, we were really being trying to curate a nice collection, and so that we put much more effort into into choosing those images. Um, but at the end of the day, every single photograph uh, ends up at the National Archives. So, what happens to those um, you know, those accidents like the misfires, or if we take an accidental photo of your foot, <laughs> something uh, like that? I mean, if it's if it's of my foot then we you know we can uh like delete it like if you're if you're <laughs> there's a couple of times when i'd be like running on the airport tarmac and you know the camera on my shoulder for whatever reason would just start fire and you know there'd be like 30 blank frames of the ground uh we would delete those but if if he would you know if if anything other than you know my foot or the ground, uh, th- th- those photos ended up at the National Archives. Even ones of him out of focus, or you know where it's sort of like it accidentally goes off, and the picture's like kind of crooked, and everybody's out of focus. But if it shows you know anybody, then that that 
photograph is also at the uh, in the National Archives. And I'm guessing it must have been quite tricky from a lighting perspective because you'd be in and out and you know move from one room to the next, and the lighting conditions would change all the time. How did you deal with that? Did you always auto shoot white balance? With... Right. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> auto white balance is what is all I ever used, unless unless I was outside in the daylight or if we were at a press conference or something like that that had, you know, color temperature lights, in other words, like tungsten type lighting, where I knew what the color temperature was for sure. I might, you know, switch the camera to 3200K or, uh, or like I say, outside daylight. But most of the time I do auto white balance because I sh everything I shot was on raw. You know, so it didn't really matter that much. Did you shoot with like auto ISO or something like that? Um, just to no, I I did auto, auto auto white balance, but everything else I I did manually. So I I kind of old school in that regard, where I would never. I don't think I ever used auto anything else. So I would always do, uh, you know, set my my ISO manually, set my shutter speed manually, shut shut my f-stop manually um and you know try to keep this is in the especially in the early the first term try to keep my iso as low as possible um because you know now it kind of doesn't matter because the the uh the digital s sensors are so i mean you can go really high on iso and not see that much noise whereas some of those digital cameras in 2009, 2010, you didn't want to go too high on your ISO. So, what would you have shot with um, back in those days? Uh, so, I, I guess when we started, uh, I was using the Canon 5D system mostly because they were the quietest, I thought the quietest DSLR, much quieter than Nikon. Um, and so we started out with the 5D Mark II. Uh, and I think we s s switched to the, the, the 5D Mark III, I guess, in the second term. I can't even remember. It's, these cameras change so often. Um, so that's, that's mostly what I use. Um, <laughs> I tried out some other, I like when Sony came out with their mirror, mirrorless, I tried those for a while. Um, I tried the, uh, you know, I tried the Nikon, I think the D850, but I found that was too loud. Um, but so I stuck with the Canon, I would say 97 or 8% of my, um, Files in the National Archives were shot with either, either the fi Canon 5D Mark II or Canon 5D Mark III. In what way was that different to um, the the Ronald Reagan years? Uh, where obviously you must have been shooting on film, I guess. Shooting on film, uh, as I recall, I was using Nikon, and um, so I think I was using Nikon FM2, FM2, or uh, no, is it FM2? I can't remember what the a, a uh, F FM. I can't, I can't even remember what it was. FM two, and then I I had a uh, also had a Leica film camera. Did you ever uh, shoot any film during the Obama years? You know what? I've never shot a, a film picture of Barack Obama. Believe it or not, you know I've been photographing him since two thousand five or two thousand four actually, and never shot a. <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day that that I was going to ask him if I could, uh, you know, um, have, photograph him on film just for once because I never have, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Do you still shoot film now, like in your spare time? Uh, you know, I have a I I I I I don't. I I shot a little bit of film. Um, can't remember if it was last year or the year before, and I have to admit, I I have them, I have the rolls that I shot still in a in a in a bag that I haven't had processed yet. Um, 
So I was thinking of maybe trying to do a film project uh, this next year. Just like, um, I still have some film cameras and I was thinking maybe I'll, maybe I'll start carrying a film camera around with me and just, uh, do, do something. I guess, I guess I was inspired because of, uh, I'm a little worried about this, you know, this whole AI and photography, how this is going to affect photography because it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's getting too easy to fake stuff. Um, and, uh, um, so it made me think of like, you know, maybe, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should shoot some film. I think, you know, I think that's a great idea. Um, and I've been thinking about the same thing, um, recently myself, actually. So, you know, my, I've grown up in digital photography really, but my dad used to, um, develop film in our bathroom, in our apartment. So I, I'm sort of. I kind of grown up with the process and the smells and the chemicals and all the rest of it. Um, but I've never developed any film um, myself. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I used to photograph on film, but then hand it over to the lab and I get the, you know, get the prints back sort of a thing. Um, but fairly recently, I kind of, I came to the same conclusion that maybe sometimes in order to keep your creativity fresh, it may actually be a good idea to take a step and do something that's, that's different rather than, you know, rather than, you know, rather than working with Photoshop and AI and, and all the rest of it, which in itself can be very creative too. But I think sometimes simplification is actually yeah. the key to enhancing your own criti creativity. There, there was a story in the New York Times a few weeks ago where there's a lot of uh, um, uh, people getting married that want to want to hire photographers that shoot on film, which I found which I found interesting. Um, also, my ultimate nightmare, by the way, <laughs> because I think somebody asked me once, like, what would be your ultimate nightmare in in terms of photography? And I said, like, you know, uh, photographing a wedding on film, because anytime anybody asks, like, oh, did you get the first kiss? And you go, uh, right, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I hope right. so. I don't no, know. but that's that was the that was the that was the that was the magic. Yeah. I guess me yeah. of photography. It was what drew me to photography. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the magic being that after you've developed the film and you're making that print and, you know, and you see it come up in the tray and you realize I got it, you know, it's, it, it's, th th there's a certain magic to that. Absolutely. That's, that's somewhat missing with, with digital where you're, you know, looking on the back of your camera yeah. to see if you got it or not. Um, you know, my daughter's just experienced that. So my daughter's, well, she just turned 12, um, but she likes photography. And um, a little while ago, we bought an Instax camera. And of course, it's a similar thing. You know, you take a picture, you have to wait a little while until it develops, you know, and, and then you can't really change it afterwards. That's, you no. know, whatever is on the print is on the print. Yeah. And yeah. um, I could see in her eyes that she was she was really quite enamored with that process, you know, because of course she's twelve, so she's never known anything that wasn't digital or wasn't on a screen yeah. in some form. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, I'm I'm in the process of trying to organize my you know pre White House archive, which is all you know negatives and slides, and. There's other photographers I know that are doing the same, and they. They they're they're posting like scans of their you know analog work on Instagram and and you know the a, a black and white uh, negative image or you know uh, a scan of a color slide just has a much different feel than a, than a digital file does you know. Uh, and it's, and it, I think that's probably the, uh, the other reason I've been thinking about shooting some film. It just has a different look. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it has a different look. And, uh, uh, you know, it's one of these things I've been forever. I've been trying to set up, I, I sometimes, you know, when I go out just for fun and I do some street photography, I live just outside of London. So it's easy to get into town and, you know, photograph some interesting, you know, city scenery. Um, and I use a little Fuji. Um, X100F, um, yeah. which is a great little camera, 
but it also allows you to uh, create these like almost like little presets that yeah. you know you can yeah. kind of you can mess around with and, and create some filmic looks. And uh, the funny thing was, I was I was sitting, I was sitting at home actually trying to trying to create some you know Kodak film type of looks. And my my daughter just looked at me and was like, "Why don't you just uh, why don't you just shoot on film? Why do you spend exactly. like hours trying to trying to get something yeah. that looks similar?" And I thought, well, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you've been you've been very active on social media. I know you've it, it feels like you've embraced social media. Um, I mean, I. I... I embraced, definitely embraced Instagram as, as a way to communicate. Um, although I think in the last couple of years, Instagram has changed so much that, um, you know, I think my, uh, posts are not as effective as they once, once were. I mean, you know, just cause there's this, the analytics, I guess, of it have changed so that, um, they are promoting, you know, these videos, they call them reels. And, you know, I just am not into that. I still do, you know, post still photos. So it doesn't get as much traction as, as the reels, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I look at it, uh, I have a pretty, you know, pretty broad reach of followers. And so I look at it as I'm my own little publisher. Uh, and so, you know, not just my photos, but what I write on Instagram, I, you know, um, that's kind of the way I communicate, I guess. Not so much on any other, I don't like, I haven't posted on Facebook in, I don't know, three or four years. I just kind of gave up on the negative, the negative commentary on Facebook and, um, and on, on Instagram, I can, you know, I, if, I have, I probably spend a half hour every day blocking all the bots that, <laughs> yeah. well, it's crazy how many there are, you know. Yeah, it's incredible. They're, they're trying to promote their Bitcoin or, um, I, I had a lot of, uh, for a long time I had a lot of, uh, porn, you know, people kind of trying to advertise porn, pornography uh, in my comments. And for whatever reason, they've kind of gone away. Um, I don't know if because Instagram themselves has has blocked them or or what. I don't know. And I now I've to... got all these uh, Russian bots, or I've got um, like tons of like Bitcoin people trying to, you know, advertise in 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 my comments. Yes, either Bitcoin uh, or I feel like I must be a favorite among Ukrainian women. Oh, that's yeah, the see, other I, type of post I get a lot. Yeah, and I had that for, I had, for, but that seems to have gone away now. Probably because I'm talking about it with you, it'll come back, but who knows? <laughs> it's very annoying, though, you know. Oh, it was extremely annoying. Yeah. I know. And, um, um, the, you know, it's got like, I, I hope it never gets to the point where I have to turn comments off, you know. I mean, now I have it so that people, only people that follow me can comment. But of course, what the Bitcoin people do is they take the time to follow me and then they comment, which is like ridiculous. But anyway. And what way do you use Twitter differently from Instagram? Twitter, I just, I just, I don't even, I don't even post photos on Twitter. I just say stupid stuff. <laughs> what? I don't mean that. I mean, I don't say stupid stuff. I, I very, uh, much, uh, overtly directly political on twitter than i am on uh on instagram yeah it's, it's very interesting i mean you know we haven't really talked much about uh, politics uh, i'm not really sure whether this is like the, the right type of show for politics generally but what is interesting actually i mean what struck me uh, to start with was that you know when because i knew you as barack obama's white house photographer and i've learned later on that you'd also you know, that you also um, in the White House during the Reagan years. And of course, here we have two polar opposites um, on the political spectrum. And that's, you know, I found that really quite interesting. It's just, to me, it just shows how, as a photographer, you know, you're really there to document what's happening at the time without any overt political bias at that point. But of course, you also do have an opinion. Well, but I didn't, I didn't, uh, 
ever express my opinion on social media until I had left the White House. You know, and I'm not a working, like I don't cover politicians, you know, for publications anymore. You know, I, the New York Times or, you know, uh, Time Magazine is not going to hire me to go photograph a politician because I now have, you know, sort of outed myself in terms of my political views, uh, which is fine. I, but, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't feel that I could uh, just sit by and not say anything. In, in terms of when Trump was elected, I felt that, um, you know, I, I, my personal opinion was that he was disrespecting the office of the presidency. And I thought I came at it from a unique perspective to talk about that. Um, but, you know, because of that, you know, I'm like I say, I'm not going to be photographing the election in 2024 for a publication because I, you know, my my personal, you know, political views have have come out very publicly. Did, did you um, was that one of the reasons why you thought you, you sort of kept yourself out of the running um, for the White House photographer for the Biden administration because you just felt that um, you can more openly speak your mind now? I, I, I mean, look, I was dreading that Joe Biden was going to ask me to be White House photographer because, for one reason, because that job just is takes so much out of you. And, you know, I had done it for eight years and I put everything in it. And you know, gave a lot up of my personal life. And I just, I was just not physically or mentally prepared or even would want to do that job again. There's no way, you know, I, I, I put everything I had into it and I just couldn't, I knew I couldn't do it again. And so I love Joe Biden. He's a great human being. But, you know, I was like, you know, there was no way I was going to do that job again. But I was dreading that he was going to call me. <laughs> Fortunately, he, you know, his, his photographer, Adam Schultz, he, he's actually doing a really good job. You, you, you don't see a lot of the behind the scenes pictures, but I know that he's, he's making them. And that's right. what matters. You know? Exactly. I remember there was, um, there was a story over here in the, in the paper. Um, about Trump's uh, White House photographer, uh, what was her name? Sheila Cra Sheila Craighead. Yeah, yeah Sheila Sheila Craighead, and um, and the fact that she was she was attempting to put a book together. Yeah, and then uh, I I don't think that happened in the end. No, Nobody. I mean, the, I all I know is what I read in the in the press here, uh, where you know it was very well sourced. So I don't, don't doubt that it wasn't true. Um, the, according to this story, she was going to do a book, had, uh, asked Trump if he would write the forward. And at first Trump wanted a cut, you know, he wanted a percentage if he was going to write a forward. And then in the end told her, uh, he wasn't going to write the forward and he didn't want her to do the book because he was going to do his own picture book of himself, which is what he did. Which is ridiculous, but were you when you uh, when you left the job, were you under like uh, some kind of NDA for for a time? Uh, I mean it's not an NDA. I mean we, when you when you get your security clearance, there's obvious um you know rules and and regulations that you have to follow. Um and then in terms of, um, like I couldn't, you know, anything that I might've overheard during a meeting, you know, I can't, you know, you know, I can't divulge that. So. So looking back at your time as a White House photographer, is there anything you would have done differently or any moments you wish you had captured differently in any way? I mean, the kind of photography that I do, which is, um, you know, uh, 
what would you call it on the fly documentary photography you know of you know you're not going to get it every time you know you're going to be a split second too late or too early occasionally hopefully i didn't that didn't happen that often but you know every once in a while you things don't quite work out you know the background's not quite right or you know your composition's a little off or i mean that's just the way it goes so i don't I tend not to dwell on that too much. I mean, I might, uh, you know, sort of kick myself for a day or two, but you know, you just, that, that's, that's just the nature of the kind of work that I do. Were you ever tempted to spray and pray? <laughs> or you just thought, well, there's something important happened. Screw it. Let's just <laughs> hit the button. <laughs> it, it was, it was really funny. Uh, this is back in the Reagan days when uh, we went to uh, Moscow and then uh, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev gave uh, Reagan a tour of Red Square. And it was with the press pool in, in following him. So I was not the only photographer there. So I was, you know, trying to get a good position just like they were, which, um, and at one point, uh, um, Gorbachev picked up this baby from somebody in Red Square and handed it to Reagan. Um, and later we were back in the uh, uh, what we call holding room a a after this event where it was just Reagan and some of his aides and I was back there. And Howard Baker, who was then the White House Chief of Staff, who was also a photographer he carried it. he says to me uh did did you get the picture with the baby uh and um i said uh um i said well i was doing a hail mary sir so i hope so you know me we call the hail mary where you hold the camera over your head because i had all these people in front of me and i was just clicking away and the Secretary of State looked at us, had never heard that term before, and said, well, does that mean you were praying that he didn't drop the kid? <laughs> anyway. Fantastic. Pete, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. You bet, Kirsten. Thanks. Okay, folks, that's all for today. This has literally blown my mind. And if you like this episode, let me recommend another episode that I think you'd like. Episode 140 with David Bergman, where we talk about photographing living legends of the music industry, the movies, and more. I'm sure you'll love it. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fleshed video version on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest photography in full Technicolor? All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you are on YouTube already, Get in touch and leave a comment and remember to hit the like button, ring the bell and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching and I'll see you again next Thursday. Bye.